Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Tom Sabru, the director of the NYU Cities Collaborative and a professor of social and cultural analysis and history. Um, thanks for joining us um, this evening uh, for our event on Sophie Gonick's new book, Dispossession and Dissent, Immigration and the Struggle for Housing in Madrid. Um, this is part of a Cities Collaborative series this semester. Um, uh, race, uh, capital, and the city. Uh, and uh, you'll see that um, all of these issues play out in very important and interesting ways in this book. Sophie Gonick's book uh, investigates immigrant activism against dispossession in Spain's capital. Um, and she did this project through an ethnography following a group of uh, of, of Im largely Andean women, Im immigrant women, um, uh, from their decisions to migrate to their entry into home ownership um, through their efforts to organize against foreclosures and evictions. She looks at home ownership, the de facto integration policy during uh, the housing boom of the early 2000s, but also situates them in uh, uh, the context of historical patterns of urban development, looking at uh, such issues as the state's reliance on property as a mechanism to fuel growth, to craft citizens, um, and to shape urban space over the course of the 20th century. She looks at foreclosure, uh, responses of the collapse of home ownership by uh, Madrid's residents, and especially the central role of immigrant women who were the first to contest foreclosure, drawing from indigenous activist traditions uh, and experiences of racialized marginalization and histories of capitalist extraction. So this, this evening, um, we're going to have a really remarkable uh, group of scholars commenting on Sophie Gonick's book with her responding and then opportunity uh, for questions and answers. Um, the order of the speakers, uh, we'll introduce them now, is as follows. Um, first up is Michael Goldman, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Minnesota. Um, he is one of the most important scholars of urbanism in the global south, with a special interest in the relationship of financialization and speculative urbanism um, to the transformation of global cities. Um, he will be followed by Gwendolyn Wright, who is one of our most prominent architectural and planning historians, Professor Emeritus at Columbia University. Um, known for many things, but especially for um, two projects that touch on Sophie Gonick's uh, book. One um, formative work, really field defining work, um, classic work on um, housing, on the politics and, and design of housing and both in the United States and in Europe and on colonial urbanism um, with an emphasis on North Africa. Uh, finally, our, our third com commentator is Vicente Rubio Pueyo, who is an adjunct faculty member in Spanish at Fordham University, um, and he is an expert on municipalism and is writing a book on the political culture um, of Spain between the 1980s and the present. So together, uh, financialization, housing, and Spain, um, we couldn't have assembled a, a, a better panel for commenting on Professor Gonick's important new book. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn over the floor um, to uh, our, our first commentator, Michael Goldman. Each, each is going to speak for no more than five to 10 minutes, um, and then with Professor Gonick having an opportunity to respond. Um, and then with luck, we'll have about 15 minutes or so for questions from the floor. So um, Michael, the floor is yours. OK. Well, thanks, Tom and Sam and Zari and everybody at the Institute for inviting me and for setting up this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, I'm excited to be here. So to start off this conversation, I'd like to say that Sophie's book, uh, in my opinion, is first and foremost a compassionate and intimate look at the volatility and precarity of city life, applicable to Madrid, but also many other cities across the globe which pivots around the global financial crisis as the major rupture and conjuncture of this story. Her book vividly portrays immigrant conditions of possibility and agency for an Andean population that left Ecuador and Peru to carve out a life in Spain and return remittances to their kin suffering under economic hardship back home. Although narrating from the landscape of the immigrant on the move, Sophie's analytics nonetheless works across scales, adeptly capturing the power and influence 
of a wide range of transnational and historical contexts and dynamics, such as the Euroization of the Spanish real estate market, the crisis of political economy in the Andes, and a rich genealogy of the notion of home ownership in Spain, starting in the earlier period of Franco's bid to transform a nation of shopkeepers and peasants into home, home, homeowners. All of which is skillfully handled by Sophie and largely told through the voices and lives of immigrants busy remaking the city. So for example, on page two, we meet Maribel, who was one of the first to protest the new standard of private property of housing. In the process, Sophie explains, Maribel and her comrades sparked one of the world's most exciting and as Sophie calls paradigmatic urban housing movements, which now serves as a model for similar struggles across the globe. Soon after we meet Mabel, a Peruvian immigrant who is determined to overcome poverty by moving to Spain like so many others. But her determination was tinged as Sophie says with sadness as she had to part ways with her daughter whom she had to leave behind in Peru. Morton, an Ecuadorian lawyer explains to Sophie the crumbling of the political economy of Ecuador and how he and so many others professional class folks landed in Madrid as paupers. Another, a mid-career Ecuadorian woman named Yvette arrived without papers and worked as a home helper in which she slept just four hours a night, she's told Sophie, always at the mercy of her imperious boss. Now, all she desired was sleep, so exhausted she could barely make conversation with her husband. This is the, this is the, the narrative tone and the context of, of Sophie's you know, brilliant, uh, book, able to move between um, oral history and deep, thoughtful analytics. Now, when these, when these folks arrive, like so many Spaniards, these immigrants suffered under extremely low wages, some of the lowest wages in all of Western Europe. Yet at the same time, Spain experienced a phenomenal real estate boom in which German and English investors, among others, covered the Spanish landscape with speculative housing projects using cheap loans and state subsidies to acquire land and slap up buildings. As Sophie explains, to fuel the urban economy, public and private banks gave out cheap loans for home mortgages to anyone who set foot into the bank. With housing values skyrocketing in 30% annual increments, you would be insane to not borrow and buy, said the bankers. And thus the urban economies of Spain, but also other parts of Europe teetered on the speculative fans, fancies of elite investors. Now for tenants who became homeowners, this was true before the financial markets collapsed. Afterwards, most borrowers quickly fell into what we can call debt bondage. Now, as Sophie explains, even immigrants without papers could walk into a bank and get a loan for a house. All the billboards and advertisements and newspapers and on social media, as she describes, made it abundantly clear that urban citizenship required home ownership. Not only was it possible to fulfill your dreams, but for domestic workers and hairdressers, among others, they could not survive and send remittances back home without a mortgage. In this way, Sophie's ethnography of the immigrant as homeowner becomes an ethnography of homeownership writ large. And as she puts it, homeownership becomes a motor of transformation creating a new regime of urban citizenship, as well as a financialized regime of belonging. But as, she knows, but as she shows, these urban regimes rely on multiple forms of dispossession, and this is key to the, to the book, eventually leading to what she calls civil death and debt, set, debt sentences for the many. For the lived experiences of the subaltern, through Sophie's unique perspective, one can learn the complex inner workings of power, in this rapacious context of speculative urbanism. Now, as one mother put it, the decision to help a loved one, her son, became, quote, disastrous as the punitive debt and bankruptcy laws in Spain forced kinship to repay the burden of a default. But as the story turns, as thousands are dispossessed and they begin to organize, led by some of these very same immigrants. As Edo describes to Sophie, quote, we said no to the system because of our experiences in Ecuador. Alone, they would eat us. But if we're many people, that won't happen. And that pretty much describes uh, the second half of the book. Rather than be outcast debtors, these affected immigrants transformed their experiences into political claims and demands. They began to call themselves the afectada, 
or the affected rather than the abject subject subjectivity of the defaulter or the debtor. And here marks the turning point in her riveting analysis from the real estate bubble to the right to the housing, to right to housing, which also is the slogan of the uh, social movement in Madrid. As she describes in the closing chapters, and as I'll close now, Madrid's Andean immigrants awoke from the quote, civil dead and moved into the active position of civil disobedience. Shifting into a new urbanism of crisis, mobilizing their quote, immigrant capital to transform the political landscape of Madrid and as well across Spain and Europe, sparking various forms of Occupy movements globally. It's really a breathtaking story that is exquisitely told. I highly recommend this book for both its rich analytics as well as, as its captivating storytelling. All too rare, of course, among academic books, capturing so well the crisis of urbanism that we all face today and the possibilities for transformation that come from the deeply affected. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I will now turn the floor over to Professor Gwendolyn Wright. You. Thank you, Tom. I'm so pleased to be here and uh, even virtually and to discuss a book that I found really extraordinarily um, compelling and insightful. Uh, as, uh, as Michael said, I think in a, in a very clear way, uh, this is great storytelling and great analysis. It's actually all too rare, especially in academia, to read a book like this that's so well written, uh, thorough and inspiring, that moves with real grace and wisdom between cultural, psychological, and historical analyses about the desire for housing and the inequities uh, that have faced so many people as they have tried to find decent places to live. Uh, and secondly, these powerful psychological and, uh, and personal narratives that humanize uh, her, uh, her insights and her analysis. And then third, a really clear explanation of the hydra-headed uh, uh, array of forces and institutions that direct and skew housing systems, um, which exist everywhere, but they vary in particular regions, nations, cities, and neighborhoods, usually promoting cruel inequities against racial minorities, women, the poor, and immigrants in all of these instances. Now, immigrants are a group that, as we know, has not been studied very closely, even though, as Tom knows very well, they've been a major force in American housing and urban development, but they're somehow just taken for granted. Um, at best, immigrants are invisible or only thought of in terms of ethnic restaurants. Uh, at worst, though, they are demonized and ostracized. Sometimes they elicit empathy and even a kind of national pride. People in, uh, in Madrid are proud that, that Andeans have wanted to come there, but there is also uh, great suspicion. And quite often, resentment uh, a fear that they will be dangerous uh, or simply that they're getting ahead through various kinds of public programs rather than hard work, which is uh, rarely, rarely the case. Sophie's book shows us that in a world as volatile, mobile, and contentious as ours, immigrants um, are a key group for all of us to remember to take account of. Um, if we speak about a national group or speak about a racial uh, or ethnic group, we need to keep bringing them into account, uh, whether as scholars, as public health advocates, as social workers, as historians, and of course, as, as political activists. Indeed, we should try to bridge the multiple academic disciplines uh, that try to understand housing, especially in cities, but often put it into segments or even silos uh, that don't pay enough attention to the fact that these are categories. Uh, they're not real experiences and they aren't 
ever uh, functioning uh, in the ways that we might use to analyze them. Um, we have to think about uh, the way that housing is simultaneously a product of deep cultural and psychological longings, a strong physiological need that we share with all animals and all human beings. It is not something that should only go to certain people or to those who were considered uh, acceptable or righteous. It is a sociology of class aspirations and national identities. Um, it is economic and political forces that may seek stability for families, but more powerfully seek to profit from these desires. Now, uh, housing is at once then universal, uh, connects all human beings, indeed all creatures in the world, but it also varies according to locales and nations. Uh, we have national histories, myths, ecologies, class systems, laws, and economies, both formal and informal, uh, that give structure to the ideals and the problems of housing in Spain, in the United States, in Brazil, in China, everywhere in the world. Uh, but Spain, as Sophie shows so well, is actually especially striking, and I think even shocking uh, to many people, even if we have laws that could be enforced, uh, we aren't as brutal in terms of how these Andean immigrants uh, have been treated, having their housing taken away from them and then having to keep paying for it. Uh, it's really a shock even to those of us who think we know something about inequities in the world. So I commend Sophie for eloquently making these people be individuals and groups, although I'd like to know a little more about what she sees as their Peruvian, Ecuadorian, uh, um, that cultural background. What are their notions uh, from those parts of the world uh, that they have about what a home should be? It's powerful in the amalgams that Sophie gives her readers, juxtaposing painful yet determined individual narratives with complex analytical data, uh, which Michael wrote so well, uh, and history, the present day and possible futures, critiques of injustice, but also a celebration of the women who have organized such uh, extraordinary social movements uh, uh, because of their deep-seated desire to have the decent homes they struggle so much for, which they were promised uh, and then believed they could attain through hard work. All of these are combined with paradoxes and policy recommendations, but also an extraordinary poetry uh, that is very moving, again, and unusual in most academic books. These immigrants had names and stories, passions and determination. They were not scamming the system, as some critics have said, in every country where this has happened, uh, nor were they simply duped by the system. They suffered unjustly. Um, many of these were women who have actively tried to right the wrongs they have suffered rather than simply seeking into despair. I fully agree with Sophie's criticism of the obsession with home ownership that is endemic and brutal in the United States, in Spain, and elsewhere, but perhaps less so. Uh, she shows how this ideology of home ownership has affected laws, policies, and attitudes. It has served the banks and financial interests while providing tax bases for local and national governments, far more than it has served the poor and working class residents, immigrants, and racial minorities who supposedly benefit from this. Her critique goes far beyond Madrid. She's right that the promotion of home ownership should be separated uh, from the ideas and the policies that seek to provide and protect both housing and homes. I think it's important that we try to think of this uh, according to our various disciplines. And as Tom said, uh, I'm an architectural and urban historian uh, who was worked in a number of places, but never in Spain. Uh, but I can certainly see many parallels 
And I'm struck by the universality of this desire for good housing as a basic right to housing, but also a need for what we call home in English, hogar or hearth uh, in Spanish, uh, meaning warmth and protection. Uh, these are not uh, simply so Hallmark cards tropes about, uh, about home, even though the National Association of Home Builders has declared that it copyrighted the term home in the United States um, and therefore everything should be going through them. It's astounding, but it is a, it's a basic human need, but it's also uh, a complex subject uh, where we have to be turning in many different directions and two different disciplines. Um, it's especially important because, of course, housing doesn't just provide for us as, uh, as adults, but it is necessary for those who are the most vulnerable, for children, for the infirm, for the elderly, uh, for friends and relatives, and one day for all of us too, because uh, we have to realize uh, that uh, the need for housing changes in the course of our lives. People should be able to benefit uh, uh, from housing, presuming they are diligent in their obligation and fulfilling their obligations. They should be able to count on it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this saga shows how these Andean immigrants in turn were blamed for the problems uh, that really made their lives be very difficult. So to disaggregate the multiple systems that regulate housing, uh, seeing how it has changed over time and from one place to another, uh, it becomes, I think, really important to, uh, to see a certain tension between this idea of home or hogar and what in Spanish is called uh, el domicilio, that is the legal, financial, and yes, the socioeconomic aspects of housing. Uh, this is a system that, again, varies according to nation and locale and group, uh, but is often especially brutal toward the people who have the most and the greatest needs. So this often translates into difficulties uh, that uh, uh, the poor, and in this case, immigrants, uh, are plagued with, but it sometimes leads uh, their neighbors to feel that uh, they got what they deserved or that they caused these problems. And as we know, these anti-immigrant, anti-racial minority uh, 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 prejudices are very strong. So I want to end with again saying that uh, Sophie's focus on this Spanish predilection uh, for the architectural project, uh, the place that is going to solve all these problems if you just buy into it quite literally uh, has occurred as she shows very clearly in her historical chapter uh, since uh, the democratic government took over after uh, the demise of Franco. Uh, um, and somehow that the efforts they made uh, backfired. Well, Sophie shows us that it wasn't Somehow, she shows us clearly um, how various institutions, attitudes, and uh, prejudices have caused this. Uh, and she gives us hope that we can do something to remedy those problems, both in Spain, in the United States, and increasingly all over the world. So thank you very much for having written such a wonderful book. I pass on. To Vicente. Thanks very much, Gwen. Vicente Rubio Pueo will now um, connect this to municipalism and to Spain and to where we go from here. Vicente. Okay. Yes, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Gwendolyn. And thanks to Sofia. And thanks to the Institute for Public Knowledge for the invitation to take part in this conversation. I'm truly honored and humble to, to be with all of you today. Well, I'm going to basically maybe at the beginning repeat what Michael and Gwendolyn has say, uh, have said. Uh, this is a wonderful book. It has, I think, uh, what every academic book on any su subject should have, but we rarely find. 
First, a subject or topic that is situated, located in a specific time, place, and context, like Latin American immigrants and housing struggles in Madrid around the 2008 crisis, but one which at the same time help us disentangle further geographies, timelines, uh, trajectories between Spain and Latin America. The genealogies of indig indigenous struggles, the structural adjustments in Latin America during the 90s, the narratives of modernization throughout uh, the Francoist dictatorship from the 50s to the arrival of the country to uh, neoliberal democracy in the 70s and 80s, and also its uh, shaping of the of the Spanish middle class. Uh, I think, well, there are these words by Francoist minister Arrese that resonate a lot in the mid chapters of the book, like, uh, queremos un país de propietarios, no de proletarios, that we want a, a country of home, homeowners, not proletarians, right? which I think encapsulate this, uh, the depth of the Francoist social engineering throughout uh, 40 years of dictatorship, right? And also, well, all these trajectories fused together in uh, around this critical point of the 2008 uh, crisis. Uh, second aspect I would like to highlight is, uh, well, the writing of the book, uh, the, the style even. It's, uh, the book is theoretically uh, very informed and, and very thus uh, very suggestive, but at the same time also it's extremely clear with a great attention to detail and a very moving and sensible closeness to the subjects, the, the people involved in these struggles and their voices. And all this is achieved uh, by, by Sophie through uh, its explicit uh, participant officer observation. I think, for example, just as an example, but the description of the PA assemblies and actions in the last chapter are among the mo most uh, vivid accounts of them uh, that this reader had, had ever encountered. Uh, starting from these two observations, let me now uh, highlight maybe two or three questions that I think make this book such a, a special one. Or in other words, uh, why you should read this book um, immediately. <laughs> um, the first one is, uh, well, probably many of us here, I think Michael already mentioned and the book mentions that, um, uh, well, many of us here are already familiar with the work of the PA the Plataforma de Afectados por las Hipotecas, a platform of people affected by, by mortgages. Uh, Sophie's book provides a wonderful entry point to the work of the PA and other groups. Basically, by well, what Sophie makes is, uh, uh, Sophie does is capture a past singular combination of a powerful subjective element on the one hand, and an extremely insightful structural analysis on the other. Thus, the PA, as, as Sophie explains, is based on an empowering horizontal model of activism, which does not aim uh, to provide services to victims, so-called victims, of a situation, but it invites its members, always named as afectadas, as Sophie stressed uh, out, um, a much more uh, encompassing and politically powerful term. Uh, so, uh, yeah, invites its members to take action in the first, always in the first person. At the same time, the, the work of the PA is based on a whole structural analysis of the Spanish economic model. It's functioning and mu multiple effects across cities, neighborhoods, families, and individuals. In other words, behind PA's approach, what we find is not only an extremely powerful example of activist practices, organizational and campaign innovation, or what Sophie terms as very beautifully and effectively, I think, plurality of imaginations, uh, but uh, this is also combined with a truly uh, moving and humane political language. But it's also, uh, there is a, also a strong political hypothesis working, so to say, in the background of that work of the PA. Namely, the certainty that once the crisis started in 2008, it was going to hit especially hard in Spain. And it was going to hit even harder in the housing and real estate industries, which were and still are, of course, <laughs> uh, one of the main sectors of uh, Spanish economy. Sophie's book deals with the ambivalence and multi-layered significance of home ownership, as uh, Wendolin and Michael has, have mentioned already. Uh, and this also helps us to understand the importance of PA, uh, which started from a parad paradoxical place, if you like, how to turn a movement based on homeowners affected by mortgages into a movement for a radical transformation of the ways we understand housing as a common good, something that lies beyond or outside the market. 
The second point, well, uh, among the trajectories that I've mentioned before, I think the, the most crucial one is the one encapsulated by the title of the book, Dispossession and Descent, or maybe better, From Dispossession, Dispossession to Descent. Uh, the most crucial point the, the book makes is precisely its vindication of the agency of immigrants, while also explaining with great depth uh, the multiplicity of oppressions and forces that shape their lives. As Sophie reminds us, um, every immigration story starts with a loss. Then the book delves into the contradictory forms of subjection that cut across uh, immigrant lives, split into separated uh, categories as social, political, and financial subjects, and their various forms of neglect, ne neglection, erasure, and also perverse uh, integration. But throughout this itinerary, Sophie helped us to uh, see an emerging power of uh, uh, immigrant or, if you like, subaltern knowledges. Or in other words, uh, Sophie explains how the immigrant subject in a context of crisis is so many times better prepared to understand, to make sense of what's going on than the native uh, middle class. In this sense, the book makes a really needed uh, point in highlighting the genealogy of housing struggles in Spain and the place of immigrants within it. It's important to remember, as Sophie does, that the first protests against foreclosures and pre pre predatory lending practices in 2007 predating the foundation of the power led by Ecuadorian immigrants. As Sophie explains, this is due to previous experience in countries of origin, a familiarity with how the political, the economic, and the domestic are closely intertwined, and how or how the macro affects the micro and how, for that very reason, immigrants can also be better prepared to act politically due to a less individualistic, more communitarian uh, ethos, which makes people more uh, eager and ready to cooperate, to help and care for, uh, of each other. This, as Sophie uh, reminds us, while coming many times from indigenous backgrounds, is not caused by some kind of, uh, let's say, exotic, rural, pure traditions, but it is also incarnated in the urban experience of many indigenous peoples, already migrants to uh, sprawling metropolis in their countries of origin. Rather than thinking of their practices and forms uh, of solidarity as some sort of backward or residual reminiscence of an idealized world, uh, Sophie's book helps us to think of them as actual uh, vanguards of forms of urban struggle. To use the old language of an even development theory, so many times the periphery can teach so many things to the core. The old colony can teach uh, things to the old metropole, or the margins can teach uh, so many things to the center, or even <laughs> those supposedly disposable life, uh, lives uh, can teach so many things to those who supposedly count in a society. As a Spaniard and as one uh, concerned with the rise of uh, far-right far forces all over the world and also in my country, I find this point uh, right now very timely and, and extremely necessary. This bring us, brings us to my last point, which tries to deal with the deep learning that uh, Sophie's book offers us and to its conclusions around intersectional urban struggles. Uh, Sophie's book incorporates this intersectional perspective from the outset, elaborating on the complex dynamics of class, race, and gender existing in housing struggle. As an example, I, particular, I particularly recommend the discussions on mas masculinity that appear several times uh, in the book. In chapter seven, um, we find some illuminating words in the voice of Josefina, one of the affectadas in the past. I will read now the, the quote by Josefina. I found great friends here, who I never would have spoken to in the outside world, neither to Maria nor Iñaki, because we are different and we are different worlds. But it turns out that there is a place of encounter where you discover other people. What Josefina is describing is perhaps the most essential aspect of any social movement. Uh, the ability to make place for encounters among peoples who under usual circumstances determined by existing class, race, gender uh, divisions would never have had the opportunity to be together. Or uh, the movement's uh, capacity to use uh, Ranciere's concept, concept used by, by Sophie, the movement's uh, capacity to disjoint the existing division of the sensible 
or to use older words, if you like, in the tradition of Epicurus and Lucretius to generate a social cleanament or an unpredictable swerve, a sort of alternative and deeper sense of uh, place-making, place if you like, uh, making place for people <clears throat> and things to happen. Reading the last sections of uh, Sophie's book, I was reminded of how the notion of ex excess works in Lefebvre's uh, Right to the City, when he describes how, despite all the oppressions and dispossessions that operate in a city every day, due to urban planning, capitalist interests, and so many other forces, a city is always able to retain its inexhaustible character. But in order to keep that character and nurture it and help it thrive, we need to learn so much, we need to listen so much, and we need to do so much. I think Sophie's book gives us some important tools to do so, tools to learn and, 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 and learn about others and about ourselves, or tools, if uh, I may put it in contradictory terms, tools to organize the excess, to organize the clean amen, the swerve. And I'm deeply thankful for, uh, to Sophie for that. That's it. Thank you. I think it's my turn now. Tom, you're muted. I'm freezing. Uh, the, the richness of the set of comments is testimony to the power of the narrative, uh, the rigorous analysis, and really the synthetic intersectional analysis um, in Sophie's book. Um, so thank you, Vicente and, uh, and, and, and Gwen and Michael for your comments. Um, now Sophie uh, Gonick is going to uh, respond to your comments and talk a little bit about the book and then we'll have time. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for those amazing comments. Um, I feel incredibly humbled to have your, um, have you all here today to uh, comment on this book. Um, and I'm really, I, I, I yeah, I, I'm kind of speechless. Um, I do wanna say, first of all, thank you to Michael, Gwen and Vicente for joining us today. Uh, thank you to Tom for introducing and organizing this event. Thank you to the Institute for Public Knowledge, which has been very supportive of me and my work over the last um, six years. Uh, Zari, Jess, Eric Kleinenberg, uh, Sam, uh, really appreciate all of the support because it doesn't just suddenly come out um, in a day, but rather takes many, many years of work and toil and uh, kind of running your head rounds in circles. Um, I do want to do two things. One, I'm going to share a couple of images and talk about the genesis of this book. And then I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from the conclusion um, to really touch upon, I think, something that, that Gwen brought up, which is the issue of the kind of a, a distinct lack of analysis of immigrants within ha within housing systems and the ways in which housing systems kind of uh, shape and produce immigrant lives and livelihoods. Um, I am trying to kind of fend off a very lively dog that's at my feet at the moment, so um, I please bear with me. But um, so I'm going to just as I say, okay, uh, so here's my book. Uh, I think, thank you to Sam for putting a link into the chat for where you can buy it. I think if you enter GONIC 20, you get 20% off. But um, this book really started because of a, a, an interest in the intersection of immigration and housing. Um, I lived in the city of Madrid between um, 2003 off and on until 2008 and saw uh, both the ways in which the city was exploding rapidly uh, with new residents and also exploding kind of urbanistically. And I was very aware of the fact that housing was really, really expensive. And so I was wondering how it was that immigrants weren't being able to afford homes. Um, 
both, you know, in any way, renting, owning, finding a place, all of it was very difficult. Um, you know, this was a kind of emblematic image in terms of the just sheer demand and the, the kind of uh, explosive uh, marketplace of urban development that characterized this moment. Um, and I first was actually doing a project, and Michael knows this because of a, a long ago SSRC uh, program that he was involved in, that I was going to be working on this large squatter settlement outside of Madrid that that had actually a lot of immigrants who were living there. Um, and I went into uh, to Madrid in the summer of 2011. This is a, a view from the squatter settlement. Um, that's a whole topic for another conversation, but it's a very interesting place. But I was in Madrid um, in the summer of 2011. I got there shortly after the occupation of the central squares, um, which characterizes the kind of 15M movement, the Indignados. And while I was there, um, the PA, the Platform for People Affected by Mortgages, blocked the first eviction in the city of Madrid. And this was um, an eviction that was blocked um, in defense of a household, um, an immigrant household. It was a Lebanese baker and a Bulgarian waitress who were both out of work. And it turned out that, you know, in this, there was this kind of call to action and over 500 people showed up that day to actually block um, the police from getting into the street and carrying out the eviction. And so I thought, okay, this is really, this is the story. This is where, you know, and for anybody who's listening, who I, I, I'm not entirely sure who you are, but um, uh, cause we don't see you, uh, the, you know, this is, if you're, kind of thinking about how one does a PhD where, you know, they have these moments of, oh, okay, here's the story, what's going on? And what I soon found that was in fact that that immigrant involvement in this, this struggle was, as they say, a feature, not a bug, that it was integral to the way in which the movement had come about and it was integral to the ways in which the movement uh, functioned. And it's with that that I would like to um, read a few, I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna read a few um, paragraphs from the uh, conclusion of my book. And I ask, you know, what might be the lessons of Madrid's immigrant activists? First of all, which I think is central to the book, is a necessity of the placing housing at the center of our analyses of migration in the city. That might seem kind of an obvious uh, point for those of us who study migration, urbanism, and housing. Housing obviously matters and is a centerpiece of the ur immigrant urban experience. Yet at the same time, there's just not a lot of material that looks to housing as a central to urban experiences of migration. Housing markets, dominant systems of tenure, and habitational struggles are key sites for understanding immigrant urban futures. In the case of Madrid, home ownership became a central device that organized labor, money and finance, calculations of risk and reward, and conceptions of the self within a society under transformation. It allowed people to gain shelter, but to also to demonstrate ability for full membership. Through home ownership, they could prove to the hostile society around them, that they were good wage earners, hard workers, diligent savers, and investors in a collective urban project. What I show, however, is that home ownership only served to further exile them to the spatial and metaphorical periphery, both because of where they bought and also how they bought. Faced with foreclosure, they saw their hard-earned gains wrested from them. In crisis, meanwhile, home ownership became a flashpoint to organize claims and articulate new politics. Finally, the housing struggles that emerged in response have provided for what integration policy could not, an arena for cooperation and inclusion, even in a moment of rising xenophobia and nativism, more generally kind of in Europe. So why hasn't housing been at the center of critical inquiry into migration um, and its kind of urban expressions? I think it's because we largely pay attention to public instances of migrant suffering, which are central both to popular understandings of mobility and the kind of elicitation of sympathy. It's a matter of borders and camps, not housing applications, eviction orders, and overdue mortgage payments. But even while it is rendered into a private system, housing structures multiple urban publics, from schooling to health outcomes, commute times to public health orders to shelter in place, 
housing shapes our ability to survive and or thrive in the city. The furthering of inequality, racism, and differential exposure to risk and even death is produced not only in the camp, the sea crossing, or the detention center, but also in the bank branch, the bureaucracy of forms and testimonies, the real estate section of the newspaper, and the overcrowded substandard living conditions of many urban areas. On the other hand, the antidotes to su such suffering might not lie with policy and planning, but rather within the confines of the neighborhood assembly, the apartment block, and the migrant collective. Immigrant struggles over housing can offer alternative modes of survival and well being. As uh, our commentators have pointed out, histories of social justice struggles, different systems of space and shelter, and ongoing marginalization and racialization allow for distinct modes of political thinking that can articulate the hypocrisies of the urban order. As they show in the book, Andean migrants insisted on the collective nature of private ruin, enmeshed as it was in a web of extraction and punishment. They articulated the violence of housing as it is subject to capitalist development, in addition to its central role in producing the city of speculative excess. But to draw out the ways in which urban development as usual is antithetical to just shelter is not sufficient. sufficient. Just as immigrant involvement Tom, can you mute yourself? Okay, thank you. Um, okay. It's not really a question of alternative interpretations of society and space. Rather, multi-ethnic and multiracial housing movements force the public to contend with the differential impacts of the property to order. Property, they demonstrate, furthers the objection of populations made other through race, gender, and migratory origins. Immigrant involvement in housing struggles seeks to redress legacies of exclusion that have conspired to produce these kinds of differential exposures um, and you know, processes of, of uh, extraction. Recent debates over rent strikes, moratoria, and urban budgets reliant on property taxes force a reckoning with dependency on private ownership as a means of financing and reproducing the city. Indeed, our, the pandemic through which we continue to um, struggle has made evident the violence and dispossession of property systems upon low-income communities of immigrants, the indigenous, and people of color, a, a reality that many movements have long denounced. Struggles over shelter already confront and strive to abolish dominant modes of producing and dwelling in the city. So too do they articulate more egalitarian forms of habitation. To reimagine the city in an age of epidemiological risk and climate catastrophe, therefore, collectives such as the POP might provide blueprints for an alternative urbanism of cooperation against the tyranny of the market. Within their insurgencies and counter imaginaries, we might find and propagate hopeful, inclusive housing and urban futures. Thank you. My Wi-Fi seems to have broken down. My apologies. Can can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, it's I've been I've been coming in and out for the last about half an hour. I'm my apologies. Um, uh, at this point. Um, uh, Let's take questions. Thank you, Sophie, for um, the wonderful comments and also for um, giving us that rich background to uh, your your book. I could actually hear you, even though the screen started fading in and fading out. So um, if, if you'd like to ask questions, please raise your your hands or use the question and answer box um, and then we will uh, respond. If I, if I go out, um, please um, uh, swim around that and um, uh, answer the questions. I'm very sorry, I don't know. Well, that was exciting. <laughs> Does anyone want to pipe up questions? Or, I mean, also, I'm happy to answer any questions from Michael, Vicente, or Gwen. Um, Gwen did ask me the provocative question as to um, kind of the, the role of home. Um, uh, oh, I, 
um, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm now I'm looking at the questions um, that have popped up. Uh, I will say, so to answer Gwen's question, I think- uh, I'm sorry, um, to answer Gwen's question, I think- Why am I hearing myself? Uh, so I, one of the things that I think I, as I went up around, went about writing this book, I realized that their idea of home was largely actually back in their homeland and that investment in home ownership. Um, and I've been thinking, you know, you think about your, the books that you've uh, that is written and like published and you can't change anymore. Um, and I think that there's a way in which, you know, the home ownership was a means of showing their kind of ability to be responsible and be good citizens, but was also, as I talk about, um, a strategy of investment such that they could return comfortably to their countries of origin and have more kind of comfortable um, retirements and provide for their family back home. And so um, that, you know, if that is a, that is somewhat of an answer, um, but, you know, maybe I'll have to go back and, and probe more specifically the ways in which they were thinking about home. Um, Meredith Broussard, my friend and colleague, um, I'm not gonna, it gives me the option to type an answer. Uh, what was that, what did I, find surprising and or delightful that I discovered, oh my God. Um, I think, wow. Uh, I mean, I was delighted at how, one of the things that was delightful was when I got to actually start being immersed in this social movement, which actually ends up as, as uh, Vicente and, and Michael kind of mentioned, it's really the last two chapters that talk mostly about the development um, uh, of the social movement. Um, but like that, even in the midst of like all of this kind of awful, just like financial hardship and, um, and terror, the terror of the possibility of losing your home, of not knowing, you know, how you were gonna basically afford uh, where you were gonna live and not knowing where, you're, you know, what the future might hold, that there was actually like a lot of sociality and fun that um, that was going on. And I, ta I talked about this instance like very so shortly after I started doing uh, my field work where I went to lunch with a bunch of women and it was just, you know, it was, it was there were Ecuadorians, Peruvians, there were some native Spaniards, some of whom have gone on to be like major politicians in um, the Spanish government. Um, and it was just like really lively and we were gossiping. And, and so this kind of the, the fun and sociality of the, the social of social movements um, was, was so delightful, even in the midst of kind of despair. Uh, I'm John Mulholland asks if I would become Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the United States. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> like, that's um, a very interesting, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm very flattered that you think that I could be um, uh, a contender for that role, but it's not one that I would take uh, with, you know, couldn't pay me millions of dollars for that role. Um, my friend Todd Shepard asks how I could talk more questions of masculinity matter in the book and gender more broadly. I think, so that's a, um, so I talk specifically about um, the, uh, let's, let me think about this, um, specifically about the gendered effects of housing dispossession and the ways in which uh, it was the house and home ownership, particularly for native Spanish men, became this kind of um, particular vehicle to serve as uh, the masculine provider. Um, and that was very much laden with ideas of how one should be kind of a contemporary man in millennial Madrid. Um, and I talk about it too, as this particular device that mediates between a very kind of gendered uh, Francoist past in which, you know, women were very much confined to the home and this, this newer um, kind of, you know, 
neoliberal democ democratic era in which also women were going back into the workforce, that it also allowed for men to envision themselves in this traditional role of provider while also kind of taking place, taking part in this um, particular economy of uh, urban development, essentially. And then what that means, um, and I talk kind of about the foreclosure of masculinity and the, and the, the ways in which uh, men going through processes of foreclosure felt themselves very much kind of neutered. And it, like I have a, a quote where one of one of the people I speak with talks about kind of being stepped on and ground down. And I understand that also as this, um, you know, the loss of a kind of a public role as being, you know, the provider and of having the job then also means the loss of a home often. And so it's a kind of complete banishment and, and it's you know one that is both internal and a banishment from one's kind of social milieu in addition to also having like very real kind of physical manifestations of no longer being able to participate in social life and you're kind of condemned to this. So I that's, um, that's part of it and then I think you know, there, there are also very particular matters related to the gender dynamics of migration from Ecuador and um, and Peru in that it was, uh, it was a, a stream of migration that was largely female led. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit. Um, so, okay. Um, so Ball Hallen, thank you. We need, I know, I agree. We need policymakers with a range of knowledge of, on housing issues. Um, and I think one of the things that I was keen to do in this book is to make us think about home ownership. Home ownership in so many places, it, it is, I mean, we have Michael Goldman here, um, who is a kind of expert on international development, wrote this beautiful ethnography of the World Bank. And he knows that one of the like major international development policies promoted by the United States of America is home ownership. And it is seen very much as this tool for um, kind of pushing people on the onto the capitalist la ladder of pro progress. And so we need to take more seriously, like what, what does it mean? How does it show up? And what are actually some of the ways in which it does things that it, you know, are completely at odds with what it promises to do. And, you know, this is still also within the United States is the dominant model of, you know, we, we talk still about like solving the housing crises through like low income home ownership, right? That it is totally the hegemonic way in which we imagine housing people in, in kind of contemporary society, unfortunately. Um, and so, to take that seriously and to think about, you know, what does that that mean and what does it actually, what are the, the dangers of that? Um, so that's, and also that, I think another thing that, that uh, the, the Spanish case shows very clearly uh, and is relevant to like NIMBY, YIMBY debates today is that just building a crap load of housing doesn't actually bring housing prices down. So, um, yeah, they actually bring housing prices down. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure anyone can hear us for this excellent session um, and to Sophie Gonick for writing such a wonderful, generative, important, and, uh, uh, and must be read book. Uh, uh, there's a link on the chat to Stanford University Press's website where you can pick up a copy of her book. It's in a nice affordable paperback uh, edition. Um, so um, please uh, pick one up and, and, and read what you've heard about tonight. Um, and and uh, I want to thank all of you for showing up tonight. And I want to apologize for my um, it's really bad Wi-Fi, uh, but thank all of you. We have folks here from all over the United States. One of the advantages of uh, um, we look forward to future events.